Hey, Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, John Everson and Phil McCoy on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. And Phil joins us this morning as well. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are, we are well, Phil. And we're, we're wondering, when do we get an in-studio Phil McCoy visit? Well, I mean, we were there like, what, was it about a month ago that we came in, approximately? John and I came in? Yeah, but yeah. it is it is difficult. We're on the other end of town, and we typically have nine a.m. or nine thirty appointments. So to get over and get back, it makes it makes it a little difficult. What's so more important, to, Phil? Yeah, well, well, you got to have your priorities we, we straight. Got, yeah, we have to take care of the clients. They're the ones that pay the bills, and so that <laughs> uh, we we tried that we, where we were coming in. I think I did that a few years ago, where we we came in and it was just it was pushing appointments back, and just became a little bit of an issue. So I, I do. We do like coming in. Though. Really do like coming in and seeing you guys. Well, Phil. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to talk to you about Secure Act 2.0. A lot of which will be uh, implemented now this year. But before I get to that, I need to ask you about the ratings downgrade by Fitch yesterday, which sent markets around the world into a uh, sell-off. And yesterday, our markets had pretty substantial losses. The Nasdaq was down two percent. S and P. Over one and a third Dow losses were almost one percent, but you said that pales in comparison to the S and P downgrade uh, a dozen years ago. Yeah, in two thousand and eleven, I do believe it was, is, and it actually happened on a Friday uh, where the downgrade occurred, and then that Monday when the markets opened up, and of course I don't remember this by memory. I have to go back and research it, uh, but the S and P dropped six point six percent on that Monday. And I think that was the first time the U.S. credit was downgraded. And to my knowledge, I said yesterday I was going to confirm this. I haven't yet. But to my knowledge, the S&P still hasn't bumped their credit rating back up to where it was prior to 2011. But as we absorb that, of course, it had never happened before. So there was nowhere to go back and, and get some you know, information about how our market should react or what happens after. This one so far, and it's early on, but so far, it seems as if it just may be a blip and we'll, we'll run past it. Yesterday wasn't that bad. And with the run-up that we've had, anytime you have a run-up like we've had so far this summer, this year, uh, anything is an excuse to sell. You want to go ahead and take your gains and run. We have a lot of data that's coming through. So if that, that, that data doesn't come through the way that we'd like, that could cause a, a slight sell-off, especially on the NASDAQ. You notice the NASDAQ struggled more than anything else yesterday and and that just simply could be because it has done better than everything else leading up to that so it's it's unknown yet to find out if and what this means but i do think that the s p downgrade would probably have more um ump in it than what the stitch would be the s p is a more widely known credit agency than than what Fitch is but we'll, we'll see and it, it will certainly be a topic of conversation heading into uh election period for sure it'll be a topic but as far as long-term reaction to our stock market that could potentially change today based off what Amazon and Apple report and what they, their future guidance is. The Fitch downgrade was based on governance or lack thereof yes. of effective communication and governance in Washington, D.C. and the lack of faith of it ever improving, it seems, in the near future. But the downgrade was soundly criticized, not necessarily take politicians out of it, but soundly criticized by a lot of financial big hitters like Jamie Dimon, who I know you have a lot of respect for. Yeah, and if you, if you really look at it, you know, the United States pays their bills, right? However, if you were, if, if Rob owed me money, and you don't, but if you did, and I found out that at 11.59 last night and the bill was due today, you and your wife are arguing about whether or not to pay me. That would make me a little nervous. So this, the actual downgrade shouldn't have been a surprise because they were warned on, I think it was May 28th, we've got you in a negative position right now. There's a possibility of a downgrade in the future. And you can look that stuff up. And it, and it had like a negative rating of, as far as what the future outlook would be. So it shouldn't have been that much of a surprise, but it was. I guess it wasn't expected. I didn't expect it, but they did warn us, and that didn't make headlines. But they, they, there was a warning for that. So basically what they're saying, honestly, I think it's the same reason the S&P did it in 2011, is there's always these debates, and that always goes up to the last minute, whether or not we're going to increase the budget and pay our bills and this 
and all this other stuff gets jammed in at the last second. And it, I guess it just makes them nervous. You know, if you, again, if you owe me money and I found out, like, yeah, Rob always pays him, but man, I just found out him and his wife are arguing about it every single night before they pay me. I'd probably be a little bit nervous and, and I'm, and I may charge you a higher rate next time that you can. You always pay me, but. You know, and, you know, look at it from a personal credit standpoint as well. There's a lot of us out there who got really good credit, right? The highest credit rating on a personal level is 850. But if your debt continues to go up and you don't pay your debt down, that credit rating may drop from an 850. Which you don't see too many people with an 850, but at 850 to an 800. Well, at the end of the day, your credit score is, score is really, really good, but it was downgraded. And that's kind of where the United States is right now. It's still a really good, highly rated credit score, just not the very top credit score. Let's get into Secure uh, Act 2.0 here, Phil. You began to get into some of these details in our Monday segment, but there are a lot to tackle here, so let's knock a few of these out. Tell me some of the major points yeah, of this. Well, the, the, now, we like to call this, and the reason I brought it up on Monday was because there was questions about Roth versus traditional, and, and that kind of falls right into the purpose of the SECURE Act. We're referring to the SECURE Act as the Rothification of workplace retirement plans, and many of us right now have Roth options in our retirement plan, but it's not mandatory. So SECURE Act 2.0 comes out, and you know, off the heels of the original SECURE Act in 2019, and you can clearly see that there's an emphasis on Roth contributions inside of ERISA or workplace retirement plans. And some of the key components, and I had long said, we talked about this, I think, in 2021. You know, I was really excited about it. But one of the components of it is right now on a employee contribution level. So if you're an employee of a company or entity, you can put away or defer compensation of $22,500 per year, and that's in 2023, and it goes up based off inflation uh, year after year, but 22.5 this year. Most, or about 70% of us, have the option of doing that tra on a traditional contribution or deferral, which will reduce our income when it comes time to go do our taxes. Or you can do it on the Roth side, the seven, about 70% of us. You can do it on the Roth side, which is to say, I'll go ahead and pay taxes on this deferral, but it's going to grow and come out tax-free as long as I reach the age of 59 and a half, or if I have want to pull some out for education, there's some, there are a few other circumstances where you can, and you have that option now. However, your employer's contribution, so whatever your employer puts in on your behalf, you have no choice right now at this moment. You have no choice. It must go to tax deferred. It's going to grow and come out 100% taxable as ordinary income. Whoever may inherit that in the future will also have to pay ordinary income tax on it as well. So the SECURE Act 2.0 says you can now employers can elect or can elect to allow employees the ability to have those contributions from the employer go to the Roth side. So I'll go ahead and pay income on that, even or income tax on that, even though I didn't see it uh, in my hand. However, I'll never have to pay on it again. The second part of that is, is if you're over the age of 50, you have a catch-up provision inside of every plan. If you're over the age of 50, you can not only do the 22500 but you can do an additional 7500 as a catch-up contribution. Well, under Secure Act 2.0, if your income is over, I think it's 145,000. If your income is over 145,000, and you're making catch-up contributions, it must go to the Roth side. You have no choice. So if you made 100, you're making 150,000, and you say, "Hey, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to do my catch-up provision. I'm going to take advantage of that." and put 30000 in, even though if you like to do the tax deferral, we'd advise against it in most cases, not all, but in most. In, but in this scenario, you wouldn't have that option. It must go to Roth. Now, this, that, that whole statement goes deeper. That's also to say if that's going to be a provision and that's going to be a rule inside of these workplace retirement plans, 
then every plan must have a Roth if you've got someone over the age of 50. That's where our excitement from it comes. So those 30% of us or people that didn't have a Roth option will in the near future must have a Roth option simply because of that rule where those over the age of 50 that earn more than 140, 145 must go to Roth. So that was a huge part of it. Also with the SECURE Act, that we, I, I really I thought it was a good idea. There's this huge debate about student loans, right, whether or not the government should pay our student loans back, and ultimately that has failed. I think there's still a, a push for it. But under SECURE Act 2.0, if you're an employee and you're paying back your student loans, your employer can use that as a basis for them making contributions on your behalf. And we're all aware of that matching contributions. If you put in 4%, I'll put in 4% sort of thing. Well, young Americans oftentimes can't do both, right? I just graduated. I got these student loan payments. I don't earn enough to save and pay off my student loans. So Secure Act said, well, your employers can help you with that a little bit. They, you can now use that as a basis. Well, uh, Mr. Employee, if you're paying off your loan, show me. You don't have to put money in the plan, and this will allow me to put money in that plan for you. So there's a lot, a lot of really good provisions in it. Now, the, the first Secure Act, there was some give and take, right? There were some things that were like, hey, yeah, we like that, and then the take was like, ooh, that's nasty. And you know, and I'm referring to required minimum distributions for children or anyone. Uh, any individual that inherits tax-deferred money that's more than 10 years different from the decedent or from the person that had passed away, those rules changed drastically, and it wasn't favorable. But in Secure Act 2.0, I really struggle to find the give back. I'm like, well, I, I like everything. I like everything about it. But it is a Rothification of workplace retirement plans. As Eric Oro could ask on, on – uh, on Facebook, it also opens it up for SEPs and SIMPLES for uh, small businesses that uses a SEP or SIMPLE or a self-employed person using a SEP or SIMPLE. You can now do that on the Roth side, whereas before you couldn't. It must be tax deferred. So it's going to really open those Roth options up for just about everybody. You know, whether or not your income is too high and you can't do it in an individual IRA or what have you, those, that Roth, there's a focus on Roth pushing money to the Roth side, and you can clearly see why our, our government would do that. The reason for it is tax income now. You know, if, I'm, if you put it on the Roth side, you're going to go ahead and pay income taxes on that. So that it would be their give back, but from a financial planner standpoint, sitting where we sit, that's not a give back at all. That's just uh, forced good judgment in a way. So we're, we're big fans of the Roth in most cases. Any questions for Phil, Matt Harvey, or John Gilstrap? Yeah, I just when it comes to inheriting the traditional 401k, we'll go the other way. If 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 I get hit by a truck tomorrow, and actually my wife and I both get hit by the same truck, I guess, then our son would inherit our investments, but the basis resets to the date of death, right? Well, that's on a non-qualified asset. Well, that was my you question. On a qualified asset, yes. it, it it does not. It does not. No. So if you have a 401k or a traditional, a tax deferred. Uh, then they would inherit that under the Secure Act 1.0 rules. Now your son, assuming that he's 10 years or more uh, younger than you, he would only have 10 years to get that out. So let's say that uh, John has been prudent and saved up $2 million and your son was the only beneficiary. On average, he's going to have to at least take out 200000 per year uh, from that IRA or 401K in order to have it emptied by that 10 year that was part that was the give back on the first secure act if it's a non-qualified asset something that you had just saved on your own it wasn't part of a workplace retirement plan you didn't defer taxes it wasn't in a roth you just kind of have it in a brokerage account and you're buying stocks or what have you that is where there's a step up in basis uh, so if you had paid a hundred dollars for a thousand dollars investment on the day of your death whatever that investment is worth on the date of your death it resets to that, assuming the titling was correct. I mean, it was listed in John's name uh, only. You would get that; they would get that stepped-up basis. But that also goes the other way. A lot of people ignore that. If you had bought an investment for a thousand dollars and the investment had dropped to a hundred dollars, well, that's not good. But you have a, a loss in there that you can take advantage of on your taxes. It also goes 
that way, and it's worth noting that because we all uh, oftentimes we ignore that part of the stepped up and stepped down rule. You also get a step down in basis in that scenario. So if you were passed away, then that investment now is what you paid for it is a hundred dollars, even though John actually paid a thousand for it when he first purchased it. So the employer option now to to help employees with student loans. Is, does that become a taxable benefit to the employee? It depends on how they put that away. So, you know, if you have, uh, and it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's workplace retirement contributions. And, and you know, like, so if, if you have a business, you must treat all the employees equally. So if they're giving uh, Rob 4%, they also must give Phil 4% of whatever our pay is. So it doesn't mean that it has to be equal dollar for dollar, but it has to be equal on a percentage basis as long as we're making those same matching contributions, right? So if you put in, I'm just using this as an example, if you put in 4%, I'll put in 4% on your behalf, and Rob makes 100000 well, I'm going to put in 4000 for Rob. If Phil only makes 50000 I'm only going to put 2000 in for Phil, but it's still equal because it's a percentage. In the past, um, and, and even still now, that doesn't go into effect until next year, I think, but in the past, the company did not, have to put in that 4% if you weren't, right? Now, if it goes on a traditional side or tax-deferred side, you will have to pay taxes on it eventually, right, when it comes out, but it allows the employer to be unfair, I guess, in a rule where they say, hey, Rob, uh, you're paying back student loans, so you can't afford to make contributions. However, you put $4,000 toward your student loans because of that, now we're able to still make that matching contribution for you. So it's really no different. It's not an additional pay per se. It's just a contribution into your retirement plan. If that employee says, hey, I want it to go to Roth, because now that's available to us, right? I want that to go to Roth if the employer has made it available. I want that to go to Roth. Well, they will pay taxes on that in the year in which it's, it's deposited. Rob would the same way I would if I made that same election. If it goes to traditional, that 4000 would be tax deferred. It, have, it, it won't have any impact on your taxes simply because it was tax deferred. But if that 4000 then grows as it should, if it grows and grows and grows, once it comes out, once you start to make uh, distributions from it in retirement or someone inherits it and they've got the 10-year rule or if it's a spouse, they get the required, they, they can take it as their own. But it's still fully taxable as ordinary income. Is this a and or proposition for the for the employee, like the employer can help contribute towards their student loan debt or retirement or both? Uh, it's either or. So if they're, if I'm going to match four percent for you, and you're you're not actually deferring your income because you're making student loan payments, then then I can I can make that contribution for you. Now if you're doing both, if you're saying hey I'm making my four percent contribution into your plan. And I'm making, I'm paying my student loans. That does not enable. That's a great question, Matt. That does not enable the employer to then put eight percent in for you. They're still capped at that four percent for the rules of fairness with everyone else. They're not allowed to do that. However, if you do two percent in your retirement plan and you're doing another two thousand towards your student loans, then they could, but they can't do more than four percent. So a young employee, and again, I'm using that four percent as right. an example, just to be clear. I'm so they have to example. choose between paying off their student loan or saving for retirement. Well, they can do them both, but you're not going to get. You're not the employer isn't going to be able to put more in for you because of that. You can do both, right? But there, it's not going to be a benefit as far as what the uh, what your company could put in for you. Phil, I appreciate during your example the very accurate description of our incomes <laughs> as well. And uh, you, you nailed mine at 100000 Yours is just fifty, And I, I appreciate you making that public for everybody. And it's yes, true. It's, yes, it is true. I make twice as much I as you. A, a lot of examples. <laughs> and so I have to make that clear. You know, that 4%, I'm just using that as an example, as well as our incomes, of course. It's just, a, just an example. <laughs> Hey, you made mention of a. Oh, before you, you made mention of uh, five twenty nine plans. I think on uh, Monday when you yeah. were on, and what you can do. Like for instance, 
But we've got 529 money left over. Both of our kids are no longer college age, so there's still money in their accounts. And I'm just kind of like waiting for a grandchild to come along to pass it along to them, I suppose. But what are my other options under Secure Act 2.0 if I don't want to do that? Now you can roll that, your beneficiary can roll that into a Roth account for their benefit. So you're, if uh, you're, you're one of your sons, you had 10 grand in it, for example, that's 10,000. It's still, it's still limited by the annual Roth IRA contribution limits, which right now for your son, it would be 6,500. So in 2024, as long as that account has been open for 15 years, then as long you can roll 6,500 of that benefit to a Roth for him. And then the next year you can clean it out and do the other 3,500, therefore never paying taxes on it. And then you really play that forward, right? So I just did 10,000. And again, just an example, but I just did 10,000 over the course of two years. Rob didn't have to pay taxes on it or a penalty. You got some sort of deduction when you put it in 15, 20 years ago, ago, it grew tax free. Now I'm going to roll it to a Roth and it's still going to grow tax free. And that is a huge benefit because it removes some of the the fear that you would have when you say, hey, I'm going to start a 529 for my one-year-old, but what if they don't go to college? And then you had to worry about the penalties and so forth. It removes a huge chunk of that where they can still use that for the benefit. You don't have to wait on a grandchild anymore. You can just give that to your son, uh, your son, and with whatever's left in there, they can roll to a Roth up to the limit. Uh, for each year so you can't do more than the limit that, that you they would do anyway on their own but it's up to those limits and you don't have to worry about holding it holding it back anymore final quick question for phil john gilstrap go i just for the life of me i don't understand why anybody thinks we need to simplify the tax process here in america <laughs> <laughs> all this makes perfect yeah. sense yeah, yeah it, it is multi-layer but I, I do feel you know with this secure act everyone should find out what their options are especially heading into next year it, it is a huge legislation, and there's a lot of benefits. And, and in some cases, your employer has the option to participate in some of this stuff. So I would encourage the, for, those, for those elements of it that it, it is an option for your employer to push and nag because it doesn't cost them any money. There to, but to be able to do that and give you the flexibility to take advantage of Roth and tax-free growth and this legislation, I don't say this a lot, but this man, this was a good one. I was really excited when that one passed. All right, Mr. O'Rourke, by the way, thank you for the shout-out, Phil. He was loving that. Absolutely. He, Eric always asks really good questions. That's oh. what that's what he said, too, by the way. And he says it's pronounced Eric on his uh, his Facebook oh. page, by the way. I didn't I know that know either. I because I've known him for a while. I've yeah. known him for a while, so I've been calling him by the wrong last name for decades. Yeah. Phil, uh, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and say us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Talk to you tomorrow morning. Thank you, guys.